today I'll be showing some data on my project looking at ways that we can improve how KRAS inhibitors um, are working in the clinic for lung cancer at the moment. So just a little bit about um, my background. So I did my uh, Bachelor of Science Advance at the University of Adelaide back in 2013. And then I joined the lab of Professor Sanatino at the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute in Adelaide. And my PhD was really looking at uh, the blood cancer multiple myeloma and how we can uh, target cell surface receptors to prevent the spread of this cancer from oh. bone to bone. I was lucky enough during my PhD to get a scholarship to go over to Germany, and this allowed me to work with our clinician partners there and look at myeloma patient samples and how the expression of the cell surface receptors there correlated with disease spread that we could see in the clinic. I then moved from Adelaide to Melbourne at the beginning of the pandemic, which was a very smart move. Um, <laughs> uh, but this was to work with Tony Tiganas at the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and also at Monash. And this was quite a big change from my PhD looking at blood cancer. And this was moving more into uh, anti-tumor immunity and harnessing the immune system to fight uh, solid tumors such as triple negative breast cancer. I then, in the beginning of 2022, joined Kate Sutherland's lab at, at the Walter and Eliza Holt Institute in Melbourne. And this was to look, start working on uh, lung cancer, both in the harnessing the immune system side, but also in targeted treatments. And I was really lucky uh, last year to receive some support for my research. So this included a Victorian Cancer Agency uh, fellowship that um, supports my salary. And of course, um, a Cure Cancer grant, which I'm going to talk to you about today. So lung cancer has one of the lowest survival rates of any cancer, and this is only 15% uh, five years after diagnosis. And even though lung cancer is the fifth most diagnosed cancer, it accounts for the most cancer-related deaths. So this is really a highly aggressive cancer that has very poor um, treatment options. So lung cancer can be very broadly categorized into non-small cell lung cancer and small cell lung cancer. But the main subtype that we focus on um, for this project is lung adenocarcinoma, which accounts for approximately 50%. So it is one of the most, um, it is the most common lung cancer that's diagnosed. But lung adenocarcinoma is very genetically complex. So there are multiple different uh, mutations that can lead to the development of this cancer in patients. So you can see here, this is what's called an oncoprint. So going from um, Going across the screen, this is patients, and everyone seeing one of these lines is a patient that harbors one of these mutations. So you can already see that there are some of the top here that are more common than others. And this, especially we're looking at uh, the gene KRAS. So one in every three lung um, cancer patients have uh, mutations in this gene. So what is KRAS? It's a protein that um, plays a really critical role in cell growth. So it can cycle from an inactive to an active state. And when it is activated, it leads to increased uh, growth and survival of cells. So lung cancers take advantage of this. And what we see is what are called KRAS activating mutations. And these mutations lead to KRAS being constantly on. And so therefore we see cancer cells having this uncontrolled tumor growth. What's been really exciting in the field is that in the last 18 months, there have been the development of drugs that target the KRAS mutation and prevent these cancers from, from constantly growing. And especially there have been two that have been used in lung cancer, and these target very specific uh, mutations in KRAS called the G12C mutation. And um, there are also some other new inhibitors that are coming out that are targeting other KRAS mutations, such as the one that's called G12D. And in the clinic, we're seeing, seeing response rates of approximately a third or so of patients. Um, and then the, for these new generation and other inhibitors, we still don't know what their response rates or how they're behaving in the clinic, as we still haven't seen them being used in patients. So the way these inhibitors work is quite simple. They're able to bind to that um, mutation that we see in KRAS. So they're specific for the mutant KRAS and this prevents uh, its signaling. So you stop seeing that increased growth and we start to see cancer cell death instead. But why um, are we seeing only these response rates of about 30 to 40% of patients and not everyone responding? 
And probably the really simple, well, the simplest answer to that is that KRAS doesn't act alone. So there are multiple different genes that are co-mutated at the same time as KRAS. And this can almost be looked at as there being multiple subtypes of uh, KRAS lung cancers. So the main one of these are these top ones that you see here and the, and the most common in patients. So one in every two patients have has a mutation in the, in also has a mutation in the gene called P53. And one in five patients, so 20%, have mutations in either KEEP1 or SDK11. But there are also, in lower frequencies, a lot of other genes that we also see mutated. And the reason we care so much about these different subtypes is that we already see in the clinic that they respond completely differently to the treatment that they get. So, uh, for example, having a P53 mutation doesn't seem to have any effect on how well a patient responds to chemotherapy. But if a patient has a KEEP1 mutation, then you start to see this really decreased survival um, when, it, when treated with chemotherapy. And so is this where we're getting that 30, 30 to 40 percent response rate to KRAS inhibitors in the clinic? And this is one of the key questions we wanted to address for this project is do the different subtypes of KRAS lung cancer respond differently to the inhibitors? And can we identify patients that are going to respond and others that are not? So the inhibitor that we chose to conduct this study with is this new inhibitor that targets the G12D mutation of KRAS. And um, this is for a number of reasons. So one of them is that it's just uh, as of about a couple of months ago, been approved to, for use in humans. And so this allows us to conduct experiments in a lab that can very quickly influence clinical trial design and, this, and the stratification of patients for treatment before they have to actually undergo treatment, before they've already undergone treatment in the clinic. And probably one of the other major things to look at is that the G12D mutation of KRAS is actually highly, highly common. So most colorectal cancers, pancreatic cancers, ovarian cancers uh, that have KRAS mutations are driven by this particular type of mutation. So any effects that we can see in lung cancer uh, that, that is driven by KRAS G12D mutations are also potentially applicable to a lot of other cancers. So the way we're on about... Um, conducting this experiment is by doing a genetic screen. And so this is going to allow us to look at lots of different subtypes of KRAS lung cancer at the same time and see how they are affected by drug treatment. So we used uh, what's quite commonly used now um, as a genetic editing tool, which is CRISPR-Cas9, which almost acts as molecular, molecular scissors. So we take out, we can take our cancer cells, um, introduce our molecular scissors to our genes of interest, and then look at how the effect of deleting those genes has on, for example, drug response in this case. So this is what we did for, with our KRAS inhibitor. We took our KRAS lung cancer cells and inserted different scissors that are targeting 10 subtypes. And so this included those more common P53 and KEEP1 subtypes as well as others. And then we treated with the KRAS inhibitor or no treatment. And this allowed us to identify resistant and sensitive subtypes. And the way you can we can just get readout of this data is, for example, at the start of this experiment, all the cells are equal. And you can see here this red cell after treatment with the inhibitor has taken over the majority of the population at the end of treatment. And so these cells could be looked at as being resistant to treatment. Whereas this blue cell, for example, is lost after treatment. And so that subtype would be sensitive. And so the results that we saw here was that the having that KEEP1 mutation is was the most resistant gene. So um, this is the sort of data, data that we get out of the genetic screen. It's really clear that when, when you look at the numbers of times that we see this KEEP1 mutation, when it's untreated, they're quite low. But as soon as you treat with the inhibitor, you get this mass increase in the number of times that we see this genetic mutation. So you can think of those KEEP1 uh, mutations as being those red cells that are taking over um, after treatment. And we can then also look at the other side and see what genes are mediating sensitivity. So the main one here was CDK and 2A. And um, again, you can kind of see the opposite effect too with the K when you have a KEEP1 mutation, where when you treat with the KRAS inhibitor, you get this decrease. And so again, you can think of these CDK and 2A cells as being those ones that disappeared after treatment. So we can confirm our genetic uh, screen results using our cell lines that we have in the lab. And so as a very simple experiment, we can take our KRAS or our KRAS KEEP1 cells, um, plate them in a dish and treat with the inhibitor and visualize using um, a viability dye. And so the darker the dye, the more viable cells. And you think you can clearly see that we have KRAS in the first column, but in the second column, we've got the KEEP1 mutation. 
and there's a lot more viable cells, so they're a lot more resistant to treatment. We can also use our um, mouse models to confirm um, these results. So we can inject either KRAS or KRAS keep one uh, cancer cells, allow, this, allow, the, allow the tumors to develop and then treat with the inhibitor. And what we saw is that when you look at the KRAS only cells, if they get treated with the inhibitor, we see a reduction in the staining for this proliferation marker called KR67. But in the keep one tumors, this staining is retained. So these tumors are really unaffected by inhibitor treatment and they're not stopping their growth. What was really um, exciting to see is that we've, we're starting to see some preliminary results come out of clinical trials with these KRAS G12C inhibitors. So these are to a different uh, mutation of KRAS. And um, what was really clear is that if patients had that keep one mutation, we're starting to see that decreased response. So the pipeline that we have in the lab here looking at um, resistance is already translating to the clinic, which is really exciting. So we can start to build this picture of the response of the different subtypes to the KRAS inhibitors with the CDKN2A um, being the most responsive and the KEEP1 being the least responsive. So there's a few things that we um, want to take this from here is is identify what the mechanism is for how KEEP1 is mediating resistance and then identifying if there's a drug that we can use to prevent um, to use in combination with the KRAS inhibitor. And so the first one I'll show you some quick data for is the use of immunotherapy to improve um, response. So we can act, we can take, the first experiment that we did is we took out the KRAS inhibitor and looked at KRAS uh, tumors that we can introduce into mice. And so these tumors can be initiated and after 12 weeks, the mice develop KRAS mutant lung tumors. And then the, the mice can be treated with the KRAS inhibitor and we can collect the tumors at the end of the experiment. And what we found is that uh, treatment with inhibitors significantly reduced the tumor burden that we see in these mice. But what was really um, exciting is that um, we started looking at the immune cell populations um, following treatment. And while we didn't see any uh, changes in the numbers of these tumor killing T cells that are coming into the tumors, we did see a reduction in the number of T cells that were exhausted. And these exhausted T cells are, uh, are not able to fight the tumor cells anymore. So having that reduced reduction re reduction in these tumor cells is would be beneficial for immunotherapy. We also saw um, an increase in other tumor killing um, subtypes, such as the natural killer cells that are also able to kill off tumors. And so this was a good initial preliminary um, data to suggest that we can combine immunotherapy with this KRAS inhibitor to hopefully get responses in patients that are currently not responding to the KRAS inhibitor. So with that, I'd just like to thank everyone involved in this project and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Thank you.